the other parts of the system can fall down as well. And this is why when we were getting the water wrong a couple of years ago, the local economy took a big hit. Tourism took a big hit. Uh, restaurant tours and workers at the beaches took a big hit. Uh, so we need to make sure that we think of these things as working all together so that we don't uh, make the mistakes that we've made in the past. Too often in the past, we've thought of water as just being an engineering solution. We need to get from point A to point B. That's a straight line. Let's do it. We didn't think far enough into the future about how those changes might impact our kids or our kids' kids. And we didn't think far enough beyond the local horizon as to how our local decisions might impact our neighbors, our neighboring counties. So what the water school is trying to do is really think big, think long-term and think in a very, very interdisciplinary fashion. We don't wanna repeat the mistakes of the past. So let me give you a little uh, indication of what the water school looks like. Don't let this big diagram uh, concern you. The main thing is it's a wheel that focuses with water at the center. So this simply represents some of the centers and institutes that we have at the water school. The, um, we have faculty from across the campus, uh, four different colleges right now involved in the water school. And then we have five degree programs in the water school proper and we're trying to begin other degree programs as well. We also have an advisory council of external community members that helps keep us on track and helps us to move our agenda uh, in, the, uh, in Southwest Florida. The main message I wanna show you here today is if you look at the faculty, the faculty in the water school come from all over the place, mathematics, philosophy, business, agriculture, theater, social work. We're uh, right in the midst of a new hire right now. We're hiring five new faculty. One of those will be an environmental economist, which will be really, really important here in Southwest Florida. We're also hiring an environmental psychologist. And then we just put a proposal before the uh, provost to talk about hiring a, um, a uh, environmental justice person as well. This would be a visiting scholar uh, to bring to Southwest Florida to make sure that we're doing all that we can to make sure that everybody and every community has access to clean water, healthy ecosystems and, and good uh, economic and social development as well. Uh, this is our current advisory board. Uh, it's a good looking group. Uh, you can see we have a lot of different communities and a lot of different organizations represented. We want to make sure that this group brings important issues to the table for us here in Southwest Florida. We've got a few more people to flesh out on this group, uh, but we think this is going to be a very, very important group that links us to the local community, the concerns of the local communities and some of the local communities uh, themselves. We can't do this without partnerships. And so I want to give you just an indication of some of the partnerships that we're developing from the local school systems, Collier and Lee County school systems, uh, for example, to important environmental organizations like the Rookery Bay National Estuary Research Reserve, the Coastal and Heartland uh, National Estuary Program Partnership, which used to be the um, Charlotte Harbor National Estuary Program, for example, uh, the Naples Botanical Garden, the Conservancy of Southwest Florida, a number of uh, universities, University of Florida, University of South Florida, Florida Atlantic University, Elon University, Clemson University, and also local communities like the city of Bonita Springs and the village of Estero. We're working with some of these municipalities as well to try and help them get on top of some of their water issues. What do we do? We're all about student success. We're about training our students to make sure that they have the knowledge and the skill sets that they need and also the habits of mind to continue to educate themselves throughout their careers and use their education to benefit themselves with their communities. We're, we're trying to develop a real culture of scholarship. Scholarship, not only just in terms of publishing papers and fancy journals, but scholarship that's applied, that's really devoted to this region. What are the issues in Southwest Florida that we need to be taking a look at and that we need to bring together people to help be part of the solution? And then of course, partnerships and programs. We're trying to create stronger, more resilient communities in Southwest Florida to contribute to a citizenry as better informed, better educated, and better able to make the tough decisions that we're, need to, that we're gonna to need to make in the future. Uh, and then of course, we wanna do our part to add to the quality of life in Southwest Florida. We all came here, most of us came here from somewhere else, but we're Southwest Floridians now. We love the area. We shop at Publix just like you do, and most of us uh, uh, you know, uh, pull up at the gas station, might be right beside you. So we're members 
of your community as well. And we want you to think of us uh, that way as we work together. We have uh, two departments in the water school. We have a, a department of marine and earth sciences and a department of ecology and environmental studies. These two departments deliver five degree programs. We have an undergraduate degree program in environmental uh, ecology, in marine science, also in environmental geology, which is a new program. We have graduate programs in environmental science and environmental studies. The environmental science program is more of a typical uh, thesis-based project. The environmental studies is more of a kind of a professional science master's degree where we actually hook students up with local businesses and local nonprofit organizations to get some hands-on experience working with those organizations. And we also have a, a number of minors that attract students from other programs who are interested in climate change, for example, and environmental education and geology. So this is the education part of what we do. When I think of education, this is what I think of, getting students out in the wild. You know, Louis Agassiz, the famous naturalist and, and um, uh, biologist at Harvard University said, study nature, not books. I think both are important but I think it's especially important to get students out on the water, in the field, uh, climbing a tree up to their neck in water. Those are the experiences that last with them and the skills that they had developed working in those environments are the skills that will really set them apart when they're looking for their jobs after they leave the university. We also have a number of centers and institutes in the water school that help us with our research and outreach arm. We have the Center for Environment and Sustainability Education. We just rebranded that as the Center for Environment and Society. This is our environmental education outreach program. This is the program that works with our K through 12 education programs. We have the uh, Wetland Academy, which trains uh, eighth grade teachers, science teachers to shadow scientists to better train their students. Uh, we have a project WET uh, through the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration that is actually looking at fifth grade uh, retention ponds on fifth grade uh, school grounds to get those kids to think about the impact of nutrients on our local waterways by looking at their local retention ponds and how they change at different, different times of the year. Uh, we also have a center for, uh, that's called the Coastal Watershed Institute. I actually founded this, well, it's hard to believe, 16, 17 years ago now, but this is the main research arm of the Institute uh, we're the ones that provide the boats and the vehicles and all the technical equipment that we need to do our work. And whenever there's a uh, call for proposals from the federal government, for example, this is the team that gets together and says, okay, who needs to be around the table? And how does this fit with Southwest Florida so we can bring more resources to Southwest Florida? Some of you may have heard of our Everglades Wetland Research Park. This is at something called the Katnick Center, which is a joint project we have with the Naples Botanical Garden. And if you haven't come down to Naples uh, uh, to our Moonlight on the Marsh series, I really, really encourage you to do so. There is no series this spring, but we'll be gearing up next spring again, once again. And this series invites uh, world-class scholars and researchers from around the world to talk about important water issues in this area and around the world. Uh, it's always packed. It's always a wonderful event. And, uh, I encourage you to come down, especially if you haven't seen the Naples Botanical Garden as well. It's a wonderful facility. And then we have our own marine field station. It's the Vester Marine Field Station named after Norm and Nancy Vester. It's a small facility down on Bonita Beach, but it gives us direct access to Estero Bay, which is the home watershed of the university. And we're just about 10 minutes away from the Gulf of Mexico. So that's where our red tide research uh, is home housed as well. We get one of our bigger boats and head right out into the Gulf of Mexico. We'll go to 30, 40, 50 miles, 60 miles offshore to monitor for red tide in the area. This is the kind of research that we do. I did a little word cloud here. So the bigger the words, uh, the more I found those words in some of our publications and grants. You'll see HABs here, harmful algal blooms, mercury. We're looking at mercury accumulation in sharks, for example. Uh, red tide is a big word there, ecosystem, water, of course, in Southwest Florida. But it's important to remind that when, uh, to remember that when we do our research, we're involving our students in that research as well. So we're not just doing research as faculty, we're training the next generation of water leaders and citizens here in Southwest Florida, many of which were born and raised here and many of which will stay here uh, when they leave Florida Gulf Coast University to make sure that we're uh, preparing the way uh, for the future. 
when we think about research, uh, it always starts in a question. This is what I tell my students. Why do? What if? How come? Um, if you're from New Orleans, you might say, why come? Um, but everything starts with a question. And so what I thought I'd do today is talk about a few of our research projects or research initiatives that we're working on. Wrap in climate change, especially sea level rise, because I know how important that is to Mr. Gowen and some of the folks there in the room. Um, and then talk a little bit about some of the new things that are going on at Florida Gulf Coast University, specifically with the water school. I wanna to talk to you first. I wanna introduce you to some of our faculty. This is Mike Savarese. Uh, Mike Sabarese is taking the lead on some of our climate change work. Um, he is a, uh, our a coastal adaptation and uh, coastal resiliency expert at the university. And Mike has been studying sea level rise in Southwest Florida for nearly 25 years now. Uh, Mike is one of our founding faculty at the university. So Mike has been looking at how sea level rise actually shapes our coastline. And one of the ways he's been doing that, he's been going back and looking in the geologic record over the last 5,000 years. And he does this by coring our local beaches, for example. This is a, a picture of him and his students driving a, a, a big uh, stainless steel or aluminum, I think, pipe into one of our local backwater areas. He brings that thing out of the water. And of course, the sediments pile on top of one another over time. So the deeper he goes, and that core, the core of sediments that comes out of the pipe, the farther he's going back in time. And so Mike has been looking over the last 5,000 years of time to see how the barrier islands have been moving, what sea level has been doing in terms of its depth and its extent in our local estuaries, for example. Uh, how, how do these sediments, what do they tell us about our past here in Southwest Florida? And based on our past, can we predict our future? Mike also has been looking at, um, um, he's been working with um, um, another researcher here named Felix Joes to be able to determine if barrier islands can actually keep pace with sea level rise. This is actually an example of Key Waden Island. Have you any of you been down to Key Waden down uh, just south of Naples Bay? So it's a beautiful island down there. On the weekends, you can see there's just boats everywhere. They're parked on the eastern shore of the island. I don't know if you can tell, but with the little striping, curved striping pattern you can see here, the, the background is to the north, the foreground is to the south. This island is actually moving south. And you can see sand is being accreted or sedimented onto the island over time. So these little kind of curved strips of grass represent times in the past when this island was shorter. Our barrier islands move with response to sea level. And sometimes they get completely swallowed up. And so this is one of the reasons we want to know, can oyster reefs, can barrier islands survive sea level rise moving forward because they do an important job in terms of protecting our coastlines and our water resources along the coastlines. So can our coastal environments keep pace with sea level rise? That's a very, very important that Mike and his group are asking. And then Mike and Felix Joes, again, Felix is a native from India where he studied monsoons for years before coming to LSU and working there, getting his PhD, and then as a postdoctoral fellow. What can we do to adapt to sea level rise, um, to change the way that we do business, to uh, change our behaviors, to come up with new innovative ways of combating sea level rise so that we can continue to live here in Southwest Florida in spite of these sea level um, changes. One of the things Dr. Joes is doing, for example, is he takes data from airplanes called LIDAR. LIDAR is kind of like using radar, but with light, use a laser beam. And what he's doing is he's mapping the beaches. This happens to be Sanibel Island you're looking at. Everything in blue is depth and everything in yellow or orange is actually on the land. But he's actually going back and looking at LIDAR data every two years and seeing how our coastline is changing in response to sea level rise so that we can assess just how vulnerable our local coastlines are to, um, to changes in sea level. Let me just, a quick aside about sea level. This is a, just a general schematic. You know, Before about 1870, we didn't have any worldwide data on sea level rise or sea level, what it was. We had anecdotal data or local data. Key West, we might've had some data, for example, um, uh, Portugal, uh, areas of Portugal might have had localized data, but there was no way of really determining 
what local data was or what global data was. It wasn't really until about the 1870s, 1880s that we started putting up tide gauges around the world. And we could kind of average those tide gauges together to understand what sea level was doing. Um, back in the late 1990s, early in the late 1990s, we started relying on satellites. Satellites can actually bounce radar to determine sea level, the level of sea level at any given point in time. And that's, uh, that's very, very detailed. We can get down to the sub-centimeter level of what the average ocean surface is. And then of course, I put a supercomputer here as well, because what we need to do is try and make predictions about the future. And um, as you know, Joe, Yogi Berry used to say, it's difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. And so we need, uh, we need computers and good modelers, uh, good researchers to help us to take this data from the past and be able to make projections that are useful for us moving forward. What we see in Florida is pretty similar to the averages we see worldwide. Average sea level wide ranges from about 1.7 to 3 millimeters per year based on where you are and what kind of technology we're using to see it. Uh, in Key West, we're averaging about 2.4 millimeters per year. That's a 10th of an inch per year. So in 10 years, that's, that's an inch. That's an inch the sea level is ribbon. That doesn't sound like much, but remember how flat South Florida is. You know, our overpasses on our interstate is about the highest point of geography here in Southwest Florida. So we have to remember how much an inch can spread horizontally, even though it's only spreading um, an inch uh, vertically. More, uh, more closer to home here in Naples, for example, sea level rise is a little bit higher than that. It's about 2.7 millimeters, a little bit more than an inch every 10 years. And when we look at this data together again, Southwest Florida tends to pretty much track the global average. It's not doing better, it's not doing worse. So we say there's no specific regional effect like you might have in other parts of the state or other parts of the country. This is a uh, global temperature over the last 130 years. And what we're doing is we're, we're using the average. So the average we're setting at zero here. So everything in red is above average and everything in blue is below average for the last 130 years. And you can see that aside from early 1940s where we had a significant and long running El Nino effect, sea level has really been consistent. Uh, I'm sorry, global te temperature has been consistently rising uh, since the at least the 1980s. Uh, we've not taken any steps backwards in terms of global temperature. And this is, of course, one of the things, one of the, the, the big thing that's driving sea level rise. Uh, when we think of sea level rise, there's a couple of things I want you to think about. <clears throat> the first is we think about the glaciers melting. You hear that a lot, right? The glaciers melting, Antarctica, the ice packs melting. And certainly that's accountable for probably two thirds of the rise in sea level that we see. But uh, how many of you have given your kids or your grandkids a lava lamp at some point? Any of you? Okay, no cool grandparents or parents here today. Oh, come on, you gotta. Well, the, the interesting thing about a lava lamp is when you, when you, before you plug the lava lamp in, there's space between the lava and the top of the lava lamp. Once you plug the lava lamp in and turn it on and uh, let it heat up, that space decreases and goes away. That's called thermal expansion. By heating the kerosene or whatever is in that lava lamp, it's actually expanding. And that's what happens with the warming planet as well. We expand the molecules in water, the H, the two, and the O, and we actually expand the volume of seawater just by increasing our temperature. And that's about responsible for another one third of the total change in sea level that we've been seeing as we're warming our climate. There are a number of organizations that put out predictions for climate change. I'm gonna to use today the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, which focuses more on uh, changes, predictions in the US. The inter um, Governmental Panel on Climate Change, of course, is the international organization that comes out with reports and predictions on a regular basis. Um, so I'm going to be focusing on Southwest Florida here and just looking at a few of these predictions. I'm going to look at the low, the intermediate, and the high predictions. I'm not going to look at the extreme predictions, although I can tell you I heard a story on NPR last week that Tampa Bay is actually trying to plan ahead for eight feet in sea level rise by the year 2100. That's going to be game changing if sea level rise gets that bad, and that's more the extreme change here. 
So this is a NOAA tool. It's a NOAA sea level rise uh, visualization tool. It's called their viewer. And so any of us can go on to NOAA. Now we're, we're the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration and play with these toys. I can also tell you that my colleague, Mike Savarese and Felix Joes, who I mentioned earlier, is also working with a colleague at the University of Florida to develop local maps that take more into consideration local topography, local bathymetry, and local assets in the region, uh, cultural heritage, in historic places in town that need to be protected. Uh, for example, the Dunbar community for Calusa remnants of the Calusa culture down here. So important cultural assets as well as uh, just property. This is a uh, current situation. The bright green, lime green represents uh, low lying areas that can be subject to flooding. And then the blue of course represents our local waterways. And I'm focusing on Cape Coral and Fort Myers and Sanibel here. This is the present mean high, higher water. Now, if we look at 2100 with the intermediate low, this is one of the low estimates. This is just an estimate of a two foot rise in sea level. And we can see water is now encroaching. Look at where all that light blue is. Estero Bay, the upper portion of Estero Bay around Hendry Creek especially is now gone. So those communities off US 41 are now underwater. Uh, if we don't do something about this. If you look at the uh, Burnt Store Marina area there of Cape Coral or Pine Island or Tarpon Bay around the northern end of Sanibel and Ding Darling Wildlife Preserve there, you can see that they're all either going to be very low lying or underwater by 2100. And this is at a relatively conservative estimate of where sea level rise is going to be if we don't uh, make changes that we need to make. Here's an intermediate level. You can see there's even a greater impact. Look at Shell Point now. Shell Point, uh, which is, I'll use my little mouse here. Shell Point here, the retirement community here, is now out on its own, completely out on its own, surrounded by water. It's its own island. Most of Estero Bay has now flooded the northern part of its uh, banks and is now encroached into communities in the southern part of, uh, of the area. Fort Myers Beach and Sanibel are heavily flooded under normal high tides. And you can see Pine Island is getting slimmer and slimmer and St. James City is heavily impacted on the southern end of Pine Island. If we go to a high, and again, I'm not talking about extreme, I'm talking about a six foot. This is well within what Tampa Bay is planning for. And think to our kids' kids' future, so the year 2100, which is just, uh, what, 90 years from now, uh, not 90 years from now, uh, 2180 years from now, right? 79 years from now. Uh, we can see that Pine Island, Boquilio is underwater now. Uh, the western portion of Cape Coral is underwater. Downtown Fort Myers, especially uh, um, Whiskey Creek is underwater. So some of our most important, uh, you can see even McGregor, some of our most important uh, uh, communities here in Southwest Florida, our historic communities are underwater. And again, this is if we don't do something now to change the way we're building on the land, what we're putting into the atmosphere that's creating these uh, issues of climate change for us. Um, you know, where's the climate change coming from? Uh, a lot of it's coming from uh, greenhouse gases that we're putting in the atmosphere. The number one greenhouse gas, just in terms of volume, is of course carbon dioxide. And that comes from anything from, you know, driving your car to um, industrial power plant production, electrical production. So the more that we can do to reduce carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, the more it will help mitigate these changes, but it won't happen overnight. This is why we have to have resolve that this is an important issue that's gonna take resolve and a long time and a big commitment to fix. We can't expect it to go overnight. You just if everybody starts driving Teslas and Nissan Leafs overnight, that's not gonna fix the problem. There's gotta be more to it um, than that. And so that's one message I wanna give you um, today. Um, the current level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is at a level that we haven't seen in 800,000 years of history, which mean we haven't seen as human beings. So this is completely uncharted territory for us. Um, so again, this is unprecedented. You'll hear some people talk about what well, climate changes. Yes, but this is climate change that's unprecedented for what we've experienced as humans. 
I mentioned earlier, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future, but there's a famous statistician named George Box that says, you know, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. And so when I ask you to look at this NOAA model under different scenarios of what sea level rise might look at, I ask you to think back to when you watch your television set during hurricane season, or when you open your newspaper, we know that these models change, but as we get closer and closer to landfall, the models get tighter and tighter. I know several days ahead of a time whether I should pack the car up, have the first aid kit ready and put water in the tub, right? I don't completely disregard the models because, because I don't have high confidence in them. I know that the models are trending in the right direction or trending in a, a direction that I can typically trust more and more. So just as we don't look at hurricane models and completely disregard them because there's some degree of uncertainty in them, I'm suggesting the same for climate models. We shouldn't throw them away because there's uncertainty. What we need to do as researchers is make sure we get a better handle on that uncertainty so that we can make the uncertainty smaller over time and increase our confidence in what the model is actually going to do. There's a huge economic impact at stake here. Uh, uh, this is a projected economic impact between today, um, the low scenario at the year 2100, that intermediate scenario I showed you, and the high scenario. Uh, the number of properties at risk today, for example, um, are about 12,000. Um, the number of properties uh, in, um, under the high scenario will be over 1 million at risk of being lost. That's a multiplier of about 85. So if we can do all that we can to make sure that we hit that low 2100 sea level rise target, it might only be six times as bad as it is right now and cost us six times as much. If we can't do what we can and we end up hitting that high target, by the year 2100, it's going to be 85 times as much damage or 85 times as much in terms of, look at that. If you look at the green box there, the scenario, the market value at risk, this is for coastal real estate, for example. Today, it's about $4 billion is at risk. At 2100, if we end up having the worst case scenario, it's $351 billion. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. And the difference between the two is about $320 billion between what we might have to invest if we don't hit our targets early and do what we can to turn this around versus being uh, very aggressive and trying to do all that we can to slow that sea level rise right now. And of course, the less market value means less property taxes. Uh, which you know may sound good to the individual homeowner, that that's really, really bad for state economics in terms of getting the kinds of uh, schools and services that we all come to count on in this state. So these are big numbers. These have big economic impacts. It's not just about the beaches. It's about the very fabric of life and the economy here in Southwest Florida. So what are we doing? Um, you hear a lot about resiliency in Southwest Florida, you hear mitigation. Mitigation is trying to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the environment, to mitigate how much we're putting in. Adaptation is learning to live with a changing coastline. Uh, adaptation is things like building differently. Maybe we make sure that all new hotels that are coming into place are built behind the dune lines and not on top of the dune lines. Uh, maybe we make sure that all new hotels and homes actually have a first floor that's open so storm surge can actually sweep through it. Uh, resilience is what's, what's left. So what can we do to actually make our communities more resilient? So in other words, they can bounce back. We can't completely protect them from sea level rise or increased hurricane storms and hurricane damage, but what can we do to help them bounce back more quickly? And so one of the things Florida Gulf Coast is doing is we're, we're kind of spearheading this effort for a Southwest Florida Regional Resiliency Compact. This is a group of 10 municipalities and three counties that are getting together right now, nine of the eight of the municipalities and one of the counties have approved this. We're trying to get together engineers and scientists and uh, city governments to be able to identify and assess the threats due to sea level rise that will face this area in Southwest Florida, and then come up with ways to collectively address them, to leverage each other's resources so it's not one community in the area pulling all the weight. But 
Can we develop a sea level rise model that we can all agree on that can help inform our planning? Can we develop tools like the tool I mentioned earlier that's a collaboration with FGCU and the University of South Florida where government officials can pull up the tool on their computer and say, what's gonna happen to this area of Fort Myers in the next 30 years that will help us to figure out how we need to change our resources and our building codes, for example, in that area. Can we work together as a region to get funding to bring outside money, federal money, because this is gonna be costly. Miami's been spending $5 billion to increase, to elevate the roadways and to try and keep those king tides, uh, the high tides that they get on a summer day uh, from impacting local businesses, for example, this is not cheap. And then how do we work together to develop a regional legislative strategy? Let's get the people in Washington, let's get our, our uh, leaders, our legislative delegation in Florida to help us help ourselves when it comes to sea level rise. And let's come up with a plan that works for us and for our communities and our residents here in Southwest Florida. One of the other impacts that we see with climate change is increased, not frequency of hurricanes, at least not in the Atlantic Ocean, but the increased strength of these storms and their ability to pick up speed and go from a category one to a category uh, five in the flash of dot. Um, so this is one of the things that my colleague, Joanne Muller has been studying. She goes by Joe, she's an Australian. We have a very international faculty um, and Joe is a paleotempestologist. I, I just like saying that word, paleotempestologist. So paleo means ancient, right? Tempest, if you read Shakespeare, you know the storm, the, the tempest, the play of the tempest starts out with a storm. So tempest is a storm. And if you ask my students what ology means, they say it means something incredibly boring. Zoology, biology, geography, you know. Um, so paleotempestology is the study of ancient hurricanes. And what Joe and her students do is they actually take cores like Mike does. They go back into their sediments to try and identify the fingerprints of historic hurricanes in Southwest Florida. Uh, let me give you an example. This is down, this is an overwash fan down near Key Waden Island in Naples. If you look at the 1991 photo, the 1991, 81 photo, I'm sorry, is before a tropical storm hit. If you look at 1984, you can see the sand has been blown through the mangroves and the shoreline vegetation there, and it's deposited on the backside. Now, as that sand gets buried over time, as new sediments get deposited in the area, that will show up in a core as something called a tempestite. It's a signature of a hurricane. And this is what Dr. Muller and her students do. Uh, Dr. Muller was featured last year on PBS, as a matter of fact, on a series called Sinking Series, uh, series Sinking Cities. So you can see her on uh, national PBS. So can we identify ancient storms? She's been able to find Donna in every core that she takes, for example, uh, from 1960s. Can we identify past hurricanes? Can we estimate the strengths of those storms in the past based on the size of these deposits, cutting open these cores to look inside of the sedimentary record? And then can we actually predict the strength and frequency of these storms based on what we, based on these climate projections? So if we look at those NOAA climate projections, for example, can we predict especially how strong these storms might be? So what I'm showing you in this picture here is a, a section, three different sections of a, a core. I'm sorry, these are three different cores from taken of different places in Southwest Florida. And T1, T2, and T3 are areas where she finds sediments that are different. And she's convinced that these are actually um, signatures of hurricanes, bigger grains that shouldn't be there that have been blown in by higher energy water that are obviously the result of a, a major storm in Southwest Florida. One of the things one of our faculty members, Darren Rumbled, in his name, uh, as his name uh, found in 2018 in the middle of our red tide, was a dead zone right off Fort Myers Beach. You hear about dead zones in the Chesapeake Bay, in, um, in the um, Mississippi River and Mississippi Delta, for example, but we get dead zones right here in Southwest Florida. And Dr. Rumbled and our students were out on a state uh, university research vessel and found over 500 square miles of dead zones. National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration went back and expanded that to over a thousand miles. No living sea life that we could see on the bottom and no oxygen on the bottom. 
Now, what Darren and his group were looking at was what is the impact? What are the short-term and long-term impacts? The good news is that six months later, he went out and the fishes were back. The ecosystem was recovering. The bad news is the warmer the water gets, the less oxygen it can hold. And so as we move forward in time, especially in shallow waters, if they don't get stirred and mixed by the wind much, you know, the oxygen's in the atmosphere, it needs to get mixed into the water. And so the stiller the airs that we have and the warmer the waters we can have, we can expect to see more dead zones developing, especially in our coastal waters moving forward. Um, so uh, this is again, just Dr. Rumbled and his group, Dr. Dr. Rumbled is a, a marine toxicologist. He's the same guy that works with mercury and other toxic substances in our foodways. Uh, but this is our students out in the Gulf of Mexico trying to find wildlife in a dead zone. Harmful algal blooms are something we need to be concerned about, especially blue-green algae blooms with respect to climate change. Climate increased temperature is something that blue-green algae is in a special like. So blue-green algae reproduce more quickly, make bigger copies of themselves, more copies of themselves when the waters are warmer. Not so much red tide, but we see this with blue-green algae. So one of the things we're trying to, to get our hands on is figuring out how rising temperatures might impact or might increase the frequency or severity of blue-green algae blooms in our local freshwater waterways in Southwest Florida and what we can do to mitigate that. So what combinations of nutrients actually cause one species of algae to run amok, to bloom where other species don't, for example? Uh, what kind of environmental conditions can we um, um, used to maybe predict when blue-green algae blooms might occur. This is a mesocosm in the Caloosahatchee River we have, for example. What we've done is we've built these little, uh, these almost plastic uh, cylinders there. We've put algae and water in there. It's the same river water, but we, we contain it. We can control the amount of nutrients in that water. We can control the amount of animals that might feed on that algae in the water while it's still exposed to the same sunlight and water temperature as the water that it's sitting in. So we're trying to determine the, the environmental conditions that might result in these freshwater algal blooms. And Dr. Barry Rosen, who we just stole from the US Geological Survey last year, he's kind of Mr. Blue-Green Algae in the state of Florida. And Dr. Toshi Urakawa, who's originally from Japan, are actually working on these projects uh, in conjunction with uh, water management districts and our Florida Department of Health. One of the things that we wanna look at with these blooms is, is there a way to actually detect them in the early stages and actually prevent them or at least limit their growth before they get big. And then of course, another issue that we find is the potential health impacts. Some of these blooms have actually been linked with ALS. Uh, when I was growing up, that was referred to as Lou Gehrig's disease, but it's a neurological disorder that can be very, very debilitating and, and result in death. So we brought in Jay Gupta, for example, from our uh, College of Health and Human Services to help us look at the epidemiology of these toxic algal blooms. If you look at people that are living on rivers, do they have more of these toxins in their lungs, for example, than people who are living inland? This is a graduate student in the upper right here, Adam Catasus, and he's installing a local, kind of an artificial lung. It's a series of filters with smaller and smaller holes. We pull a vacuum on the bottom of it so that it breathes, it brings in air. And that gives us an indication of how far these toxins and how far these cells might actually be getting into the human lungs. This is a collaboration we're currently doing with Yale University uh, to again, try and identify what the potential human impacts are of these blue-green algae blooms here in Southwest Florida. Red tide, you know, we don't have good evidence that um, rising temperatures are gonna make red tide worse. Um, but there are other things that we can do we think that can help red tide make it better once it starts. Red tide, unlike blue-green algae blooms, starts offshore. Unlike blue-green algae blooms, it starts in marine waters instead of fresh waters. And unlike blue-green algae blooms, it typically starts in the cooler months, November through February, for example, rather than in the warmer months where we see the blue-green algae blooms. So these are different beasts entirely. So try not to get them confused with one another. So red tide starts 50 miles offshore, again, then gets carried by winds and currents inshore. So what we're trying to decide is once, or trying to find out is once it gets carried inshore, 
what are the things that we could be doing differently that makes it go away more quickly or makes it not grow as much? So can we detect red tide blooms when they're far offshore before they're even heading our direction? Uh, you know, we can, we can see them coming. We have satellites that can help us see them coming. The red colors there on that image is actually high concentrations of red tide, for example. Problem is, of course, we can't get out of the way. So can we treat these smaller areas and prevent them from coming, um, joining and, and becoming bigger blooms, uh, preventing large fish kills? Mike Parsons, who's actually on the state's Blue Green Algae Task Force and who runs our Vester Field Station, is actually doing a study with Moat Marine Laboratory now. Can we scoop up the fishes that are killed by red tide and actually compost them and use them to fertilize farmland? Because when those fishes die in the water, they release additional nutrients that can actually feed the red tide bloom. So maybe harvesting fishes, composting those, and then using those as fertilizer for agricultural land is one thing that we can do to keep the red tide from becoming as big. So if you want a volunteer project and don't mind what you smell like when you go home at the end of the day, just let me know and I'll hook you up with Mike Parsons. He's got some great students that are helping him out and we're always looking for volunteers. So again, we know red tide starts offshore, but once it gets along our coastlines, can, are there things that we can do that can minimize the ecological damage, the economic damage, and the reduction in the quality of lifestyle that we have uh, based on some of the things that we're doing in the area? And then of course, you know, part of the problem we're facing in Florida is that a thousand people are moving to Florida per day. And this places tremendous demands on our natural systems. And these natural systems are a way of keeping our waters healthy and clean, preventing nutrients to come in, excess nutrients coming into our waterways. For example, we wouldn't have to worry so much about climate change and blue-green algae blooms if we didn't have so many nutrients coming in that create the blue-green algae blooms in the first place. So one of the things we're really trying to do is look at how important our wetlands are in terms of keeping our waters clean, keeping our waters healthy, keeping our waters free from, uh, uh, from harmful algal blooms. Um, how much carbon can our plants store? You know, as we replace plants with gated golf course communities, which is where I live, for example, that's less, that's more carbon dioxide that goes in the atmosphere unless that's actually stored by nature itself. Our mangrove systems, not only can we restore and recreate wetlands, but can our mangrove systems actually protect our shorelines and be one of the ways that we're resilient, our communities are resilient. If we had more natural mangrove shorelines and less seawalls, we would be more resilient and can actually grow with climate change as well, rather than having it just overwhelm us. So let me just tell you, kind of close with a little bit more about the water school. You know, I, I think we're, we're having a real important impact in the region. We're addressing issues of regional concern. These are issues you tell us about. We work with you. We try and figure out what you think is important, not necessarily what we as an individual scientist really, what really you know, floats our boat. We're, I think, actually making an important economic impact. We're keeping talent in this area. Students no longer need to go to Gainesville or to Miami to get a strong college or graduate degree they can stay right here in Fort Myers and do so. We're recruiting new faculty and staff and students in the area. So we're recruiting talent to the area. Uh, we're actually recruiting students uh, in our graduate programs, for example, in the water school, about 50% of our students come from out of state, not Florida. Our undergraduate programs, 90% of our students come from Florida. And of course, we've got a return on investment. I did a, a, you know, a back of the napkin calculation for every dollar we're paid to do research in the area, we generate about $3.05 in the local community. So every grant that we bring in from the federal government or the state government to this region, for example, ends up buying fuel for boats or buying supplies or equipment or goes into a graduate student or an undergraduate student's pocket and they end up in the grocery store. And then of course, our students are making an important difference in their region. They're not only uh, getting, uh, working with our local communities through service learning and internships, for example, um, but they're also uh, making important contributions in science and outreach 
in this region, you'd be surprised at how many different types of internships our water school students work at. So uh, for those of you who are uh, no local businesses, local nonprofits, you might have run into one of our water school students there getting that hands on important part of the education and connecting with the community while they're here in Southwest Florida. Um, my president, President Martin asked me to use this kind of a slide, the insert name here, Water School, uh, just to let people know that we're still looking for financial support. So if you know people who have deep pockets, uh, please send them our way. Uh, we wanna really get the Water School. This is currently scheduled to be online in uh, January next, so less than a year now. Uh, this will be the largest school on campus by a factor of two, 114,000 square feet, about 25,000 square feet of laboratory space, another 16,000 square feet of uh, classroom space and another 8,000 square feet of meeting space. We want you to think about the water school as being your water school. We're gonna have events there, family friendly events, seminar series, art shows. We want you to come to the water school, have a little glass of wine with us, a little bit of cheese, uh, share your experience and your concerns with our faculty and our students as we move forward to work together to try and save, um, uh, to keep Southwest Florida what we all appreciate it and expect it to be. With that, let me just add a, a quick video of the new water school here. Let me see if I can share this one. Um, So this is an animation of what the water school will look like. And I know how important Gerald uh, thinks of uh, solar power. You'll notice that the water school has, will have about 30% of its power drawn from solar. So there will be a solar farm on top of the water school. We're trying to do what we can to go more carbon neutral here in Southwest Florida to do our part. And if you haven't been out to campus lately, I go out every Friday and take pictures of this thing. It's a gorgeous building. It's already run one, one award. It uses state-of-the-art materials to decrease the impact of uh, solar, uh, of the natural sunlight, reduce the heat input in the building. It's got a series of shades and veins that actually uh, help reduce the amount of sunlight, direct sunlight that comes in while we still have good light so that we can reduce our electricity need inside the building. And again, this will be a real game changer for our students. This will be uh, a research facility that will help us accomplish our mission in terms of educating our students, in terms of especially conducting research that's important to all of us here in Southwest Florida as we move forward. Four-story atrium. Uh, again, we really think it's gonna be an outstanding place and. We really hope you'll come visit us out here at the water school. I'll make sure we work with Mr. Goen here and make sure that you get invitations to do so. We, we want you to be, we want to be connected with you in this community and work with you. And uh, we want to let you know that you're a part of us as well. So uh, come join us, take a class, uh, come to an art show when we're open back up again. Um, but no matter how you think you might want to be involved with the university, I can assure you that we can find a way that matches your interests. So with that, I'll say thank you very, very much for your time. And I'll be happy to try and answer any questions you might have. Sean, I have Ma a question. Yes, yes. do it. Yes, uh, Greg, you addressed many water issues. One thing that uh, wasn't covered is the serious uh, decline in the water levels in our freshwater aquifers and the salinization that's resulting in the deep aquifers from excess use uh, the runoff, the waste of fresh water is not restoring because of overdevelopment and runoff. Is, is your school addressing any of these water use and water conservation programs for uh, retention uh, and conservation of fresh water? We are in, in different ways. We are, for example, we have an expert in our College of Engineering who works on desal works on desalination. 
Uh, as you know, probably the city of Cape Coral is a big uh, you know, desalinization, desalination center. Uh, Tampa has a, a desal uh, unit up there as well that they've had major issues with. Uh, we're also, um, we have a group that works with local communities um, to try and kind of conserve and filter water uh, in your local neighborhoods before it actually gets into um, our, our local waterways. I, I, I just kind of paid a, a passing mention to this. This is a real, a real challenge for our state. A thousand of us are moving here per day. Yeah. And that's changing the face of our landscape. And, you know, we're not all just moving to the beaches. That's where most of us are. Probably 70% of us are at the beaches or along the I-4 corridor. But 80% of the water is in North Florida. 80% of the need is in South Florida. And that's creating a huge issue. I recommend, uh, you know, that you buy a book called Drying Up. Uh, it's about the Florida freshwater delivery issue in Florida. It's a great book. It's only about a year old. I think it was published uh, 2019. That would be a great book for this group to buy a copy of and then pass among yourselves. But it really, really addresses those issues. And of course, the, the elephant in the room is the, is the thousand people moving Florida today. So as we move inland, agriculture has to move further inland. As agriculture moves further inland, we're moving in on wetland areas that previously served as the kidneys for our coastal communities here in Florida. And without those kidneys, we're gonna to have to come up with some other way to some other new technologies uh, and these deep well injections and uh, other solutions. Again, I just kind of caution us against uh, about these quick fix concrete solutions because we just don't think far enough into the future about how that may impact our kids and our grandkids. But that's a really, really great book. And based on uh, your, your excellent question, I'd recommend you're getting that and reading. It's a good read. The agriculture is an important element in the economy of Florida, but it's also a big contributor to global warming, uh, carbon dioxide emissions, and also uh, misuse of water, overuse of water. Uh, of course, U.S. sugar is a big problem. Uh, is there any program to engage agriculture to improve their, their, their practices and, and policies uh, to reduce the serious impact? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question. So last year, not this last November, but the November of 2019, the Water School went together with the College of Business. The College of Business has something called the Center for Agribusiness. And we actually held a workshop here on campus to bring scientists and farmers and operators, owners and operators together to start talking about water issues. Um, Water is an issue, it's especially with respect to nutrients and water use. Uh, globally, probably 70% of our water use is agriculture. Yeah. That's important because we need to eat, but we also need to be making sure that we do it in a way that's as sustainable and as resilient as possible. Um, there are a lot of new techniques out there. I know uh, some of our local farms use micro-irrigation. They actually will put just a tiny bit of fertilizer. They refer to it as life support keeping their plants on life support. If they did any less, the plants wouldn't survive. So they're trying to do the minimum to get a good product. Not all of our growers are doing such a good job in that. And so what we need to do is I think, link what we're doing at the water school with the best management practices they'd have to make sure that those best management practice or practices are working and that are making sure that the water, when it does reach our local estuaries and rivers is clean and healthy water and will not contribute to, to harmful algal blooms. The other thing that we're doing, we, we are also working with some of the, the water management district on some of these uh, stormwater treatment areas. Uh, so south of Lake Okeechobee, one of our master students just did a, a thesis to study how, how good a job these stormwater treatment areas are doing and removing nutrients before we release it south to the estuaries. And then my students and I are currently working on a study. So before and after study to look at the, uh, how efficient the new, what's called the C43 West Basin Storage Reservoir, which is a big, I think it's a 170,000 acre feet. So if you think about a reservoir that's 170,000 acres and one foot deep, that's how much water it would store. And this is just south of the Caloosahatchee River upstream. But the idea is to capture water during the flood season 
and not send it downstream to create harmful algal blooms, but then deliver it during the dry season so that we can have a healthier estuary. So my students are, and I are actually, we were out on the Caloosahatchee River at night, two uh, nights last week, actually working on that project. So there's a number of areas that we're working on to try and um, try and crack that nut, but the, the real issue is getting agriculture to the table. And so I've got agriculture representatives on the water school. We have the center for Agri agribusiness, but we need to be getting, um, whether it's Big Sugar or Lippman Farms or uh, King Ranch with the citrus, we need to get all these folks at the table and quit, quit putting bullseyes on each other and refusing to talk to each other. We need to work through that. We, we live in a very, very highly political environment, a highly partisan environment these days, and it's really damaging our ability to work effectively together. So we really need to come together and listen to each other uh, and, and still fight for our causes, but do it in a way that's, uh, that's collaborative and not adversarial. Thank you. We're, uh, we're working, Joan and I are working on, on talking to Dr. Fritz Roca as a possible guest later on, uh, who's the head of the Ag School. We can speak to these topics, I'm sure. Fritz is great. Fritz is a member of the water school as well. Yeah, he's, he's great. He, he used to work with IFAS, you know, the Institute for Food and Agricultural Science with the University of Florida. So uh, Fritz would be a great addition to your team there. You know, I, I experienced uh, your work with your students here on the, the Ostero River. Uh, they're in, familiar to me too. in our yeah. backyard every few weeks, uh, pulling samples and stuff. And I really want to compliment you on the use of your students involved in the research. It means so much. I, many, many years ago, I started an environmental program at a two-year college just for the purpose of teaching hands-on sampling, water sampling and stuff. This was in 1970. Uh, so I appreciate it. Could we used to get students coming from Ohio State and stuff after they had gone through, been in a four-year program to come back to a two-year program just to get some of the sampling experience. That's great. And we good work, to see it work that way. Well, we work closely with Bill and Steve Sarkozy. We're, as a matter of fact, Steve and, and I are trying to work through a plan right now where we can expand what we're doing to other parts of the Estero watershed. So that's a great example, I think, of a partnership that we're, that we're growing. We're trying, you know, we're having little fits and starts, but we're trying to really work in our local community and it benefits our students so much. So thank you for that. Do we have other questions? Yes, Greg. Yes. Uh, what do you need most from the community? Well, your general support. Uh, you know, beyond that, you know, I can send you to the right people, but we need your general support. For example, right now, I think not just for FGCU, but for all of us, if you can call your local county commissioner and say, hey, this climate compact, this resiliency compact is important. We really want to see it pass. So far, Lee and Collier counties have not approved this. We really need to have them to prove that if we're going to move forward and make some regional progress on that. So I can't lobby my own state because I'm a state employee. But, um, but I think that would be very, very important for the region. Get involved with the water school. Now, it's hard to do that with, the, with COVID right now. Uh, we're all kind of tired of COVID. But when, we, um, but when we open and open at the water school starting next spring, come out and see a, uh, a talk, uh, come out to our events, get involved, keep yourselves uh, informed, better informed. Because once you do that, then just working together, working with each other, I'm so glad to see so many faith leaders these days and faith centers. I spoke with Temple Shalom just a few weeks ago with their Tikamalam group, which is a climate and environment group as well. And it's, it's, so, it's so gratifying to see so many faith leaders stepping forward and say, we need to be part of the solutions here. So talk with the members of your congregation, talk with the members of your homeowner associations, talk with your legislative representatives, your civic leaders, and let them know what's on your mind because they make their decisions based on what they think you think is important. They don't listen to me um, to help, they, they listen to me maybe this much to help make their decisions, but they listen to you a, a, a great amount. 
And then, of course, anything you can anything you can do to help one of our students through a scholarship or if you know people that have internships, um, you know, uh, you know, there's lots of opportunities for doing that. But but we want you to be more part of us. I think once you, um, you know, uh, I think we'll find a home for you here and we certainly want to make connections with you, learn more about you, why you're here in Florida, what concerns you here in Florida and what we can do to connect better with you. So. Thanks for that question. Mm -hmm. And if you have $10 million, it can be the blank water school. So, uh, but. <laughs> Good plug. <All right. laughs> yes. Greg, uh, what, do you what do you think about reverse osmosis systems for drinking water and what impact they might have on the environment? Is that a, is that a good thing? Because Tarpon Springs did. The solar that I've talked to you about is the solar field is at the reverse osmosis state, uh, station. And they did that to ensure their community that they had drinking water. They got 80% of their drinking water through Pinellas County. They don't get any now. They're producing their, their own drinking water. If every yeah, community I mean, did that, would it help? Yeah, I think it helps if it's done in the right way. You're probably you're probably uh, familiar with Florida Water and the Tampa Bay experiment where they they you know they had a technical issue that it, it's been a ten year nightmare up there. But um, desal is expensive. Um, it's uh, it's it, it it tends to work pretty well. It takes a lot of maintenance. It's very energy consumptive. I like the idea that what they did in Tarpon Springs was kind of think of these things as systems. Let's look at a sustainable energy system to create a water supply system. Uh, I also think that, that you know, there's a lot of low hanging fruit. I think between what we do in our own homes to conserve water and what we can do with agriculture and businesses to conserve water, if we're, if we're mindful every time we turn on the tap, we're just mindful of that 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 water going down the sink is new water we're gonna to have to find from somewhere else. If we start thinking along those lines, there's also a tremendous amount of water that we can save just through conservation. Um, not, not irrigating the desert to create golf courses in Arizona, for example. Um, not putting, you know, using native vegetation, native vegetation that is used to living on low water inputs instead of using more exotic and oftentimes more beautiful, not always, but oftentimes more beautiful, or at least it's more familiar to us, but high use plants, high water use plants, and in some cases, high fertilizer use plants. Um, so there's a lot we can also do with cons uh, conservation. And, and then of course, you know, we're exploring some of these other things. Uh, you know, um, one of my colleagues here is looking at desal uh, from uh, brackish water, because it's not, you know, it's not good enough for drinking water anyway, but um, um, it's not as much work, doesn't take as much energy to create fresh water from full strength uh, seawater, for example. But if you look at different parts of the world, if you look at the Mideast, if you look at um, Israel right now, Israel's investing a lot in desal, um, but it's much more expensive and it's just cheaper and it's more affordable and it's more equitable in terms of social equity and social justice if we learn to conserve what we have and to build and grow within that environment instead of the super, super high consumptive lifestyles that, that we're fortunate enough to be able to live here in Florida. Um, but again, that has impacts and long-term, that's, that's gonna impact our kids and our grandkids. So again, desal is a big part of, uh, of that book drying up. Um, so that, I think that mm -hmm. book does a better job of trying to identify Florida's various uh, problems. I wish I'd written the book. Uh, not only would I um, be a little bit wealthier right now, I think, but uh, I, I could just retire. I, it's, it, I'd just be so proud of that book. It's something that whose time had come to kind of take all of Florida's different water issues and put them into a single story that reads well for the general population uh, that, that kind of drives home um, how we're each responsible for this and what we need to be doing. So I, I really think that book is a is a good place to start for the, those of you who are interested in this. Okay. Dawn? Yes, Joyce. Yes, I understand Greg is a state employee and can't talk about politics, but uh, political action is critical. Uh, 
I've been involved with environmental political action since 1969 and 70 in Minnesota. Uh, our Sierra Club launched the, had the first successful lawsuit in America against reserve mining for dumping taconite into Lake Superior, which affected the plankton. Uh, it was the first lawsuit that was successful for the environment that was using their court systems. We also got together with Northern States Power in a cooperative endeavor and appealing to them from a moral and uh, basis and had regular meetings to get them to stop dumping hot water into the Mississippi River. That was cooperating with industry and it was successful. Uh, that was back in about 1970. Here in Florida, a few years back, uh, FPL wanted to build a coal-fired uh, power plant on Lake Okeechobee. It was approved by the House and the Senate. We wrote letters to uh, Governor Charlie Crist, who was also Republican, along with the legislature. We appealed to him how devastating this would be to the quality of water and the quality of life. And he vetoed that. Uh, there was another uh, thing, an environmental thing that we wrote to him about. He, he did two or three different vetoes uh, based on the fact that many of us wrote to him with kind of a moral appeal. Uh, after that, uh, he left the party he was with and changed parties in part and we invited him to come and talk to us. And he said that it was our letters that changed him. Uh, and it was not only did it change his actions, but his viewpoint of public service. Uh, so you can't underestimate the power of moral persuasion and commitment to the quality of life. It's something that we can all share it goes above and beyond the economic arguments. And there are people who don't necessarily believe in the effect of climate change, but there are many other things like just what kind of air are your children breathing and what kind of water are they drinking uh, that are current and it, it's present. It isn't just in, in the year, you know, 2100. So I think that we, we do have to engage in political action. Uh, it should be nonpartisan. It should appeal to the better interests of our common good. Uh, well, as you know, um, uh, Joyce, we, we are trying to have a, an ongoing campaign of letter writing. And uh, I think that uh, certainly there are uh, plenty of things for us to to focus on in this presentation uh, that we can write to our commissioners and yes. others uh, uh, in the state and the local governments uh, so that we can perhaps um, have some influence on their decision making. Thank you for pointing out to us uh, that important obligation that we have. I'm so glad you recorded that too. That was a very eloquent uh, call to action. That was, uh, I, I think, very, very eloquent, and and uh, that's absolutely what we need. The um, the average citizen, the average person, uh, I'm one too, and I have a voice as a citizen, and I talk about politics. Don't get me wrong; I just can't lobby my legislature for a particular act. What I do tell is my uh, legislative representatives: if you ever have an issue that comes before you that involves water in some way. I would be happy to give you the, the latest up-to-date science to help you make that decision. So. Joan? Yes, go ahead. Yes, I, just, I just have a quick comment. First of all, this was a fabulous presentation. It gives me hope for the future. Um, and the one, one little thing uh, that really made me perk up my ears because my entire family is educators is when you mentioned that you have programs for K through 12. Um, because educating our children is so important and, and they will take what we give them and carry it forward. Yes, absolutely. That's our future. That. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, do we have other comments or questions? Oh. 
I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know. I'm on speaker view, so I can't see if you're raising your hand. Let me go back to gallery view here. Uh, Mr. Gowen has his hands up. Okay, Mr. Gowen. Yes, Carol. Carol, uh, are you muted? I don't Carol, think so. you're on mute. Unmute yourself. Hello. Now you can hear me. Okay. Uh, just this week, through my daughter, I am making contact with a staffer at the county level. It is my intent to address the county council and to work with them on all these issues uh, to raise their awareness. The, the legislators and citizenry too need to hear this presentation. It was when I started going to those kind of seminars, one day and two day seminars back five and six years ago that I got educated. I had a sense of things anyway, but I got, I got some facts. I got some things I could hang my hat on. And this, and your water school here, uh, I, I think if I die tomorrow, and I may, uh, I'll die a little happier knowing that, that, that you're on, on the job. This, this compact that is establishing, they've done it on the East Coast. They've had some success. I don't know if they've had all the success they need to have, but that's a large part of the answer uh, of these county schools. So we, we might center somehow on getting Lee and Collier County to come on board, to get in this thing. Uh, I can't do it. You can't do it, but they together can, if, if they only will. But they need they need to see the presentation. They need they, they need to feel it uh, in their bones. Whether it's approached by economics, solar will save you money, or whether it's a moral issue, as Joyce, they're both. You can use them both, and I'm going to try to do that when I speak to them in two minutes, uh, sometime. <laughs> So some of you, some of you get, some of you speak to them. No, don't get, write, write to them if you wish to, and write to them and then, and then speak to them. Work through your county commissioner and say, I want to speak to you folks. It's your water. Water should be a basic human right. It's your water, so. That's right. Yes. Water, water everywhere, but area drop to drink. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, Gary. Yes. Um, I just wanted to mention that some of us um, uh, are going to be meeting with some folks from um, from Fort Myers on Monday, talking about rights of nature. And of course, uh, Greg, you must know the what has happened up in in Orange County and the right to clean water that was passed up there in November uh, by I mean giving giving the citizens of Orange County a right to clean water and giving them standing to sue. Uh, we're hoping through Lee County Rights of Nature organization that I'm a member of uh, to have that same kind of protection for people here in Southwest Florida. And we do have uh, several communities that are interested in, in pursuing that, uh, in getting their, their town charters. Uh, passing uh, amendments to their town charters to guarantee that. Excellent. And of course, it's a, it's a democracy issue as well as a, as a water issue. And, uh, and water is the way that we were able in, in Orange County to, to get the issue passed because rights of nature in general seems too difficult for some folks to understand giving rights to, to things that have never had rights before. But we point out that women didn't have the right to vote. And we, we took, you know, there was a long fight to get that to go. And um, so there's other issues that we can, we can count on. But I'm also involved in the Reset Center. And uh, we are fascinated, uh, we are working on 
trying to get to the root causes of the crises that we are facing in Southwest Florida. Uh, Thoreau said that there are a thousand people hacking at the branches of evil for every one striking at the root. And so we wanna be the ones striking at the root of the issues in Southwest Florida. So we'll, we'll be in touch with you some more. Uh, we, I know that we've got good contacts with, with you and your, your colleagues out there at the university and yes. look forward to working with you. And I hope that we can get together before uh, students actually come back on campus so that yes. we, we've got something in the works. That sounds great. Keep up the great work too. Thank you. You as well, my goodness. Yes. <laughs> away by what's happened in these few years. Uh, I can't see anyone else raising their hands at the moment. Let me just see if there, I don't have everyone's image in front of me. You can speak up if you are trying to get attention. Well, if not, I, I would like very much to um, thank Dr. Tolley for this presentation. Um, you, you've had an audience here of people who uh, are knowledgeable and very concerned and engaged in trying to make a difference. And uh, you have given us so much to think about and so much to act upon, uh, which is what we seek. Uh, so thank you so much for, for your time and for this excellent presentation. Um, I, I have voluminous notes here. <laughs> um, so I'm... I'm uh, <laughs> well, well, thank you all. And, and, and I can say that, you know, having people like you in the community that are concerned and care and are willing to take action on these issues gives me hope as well. Good. Wonderful. Well... Uh, we are going to, we, we uh, normally would end our meetings at three. If, and if you want to stay and do any updating on things that you'd like this group to know about, uh, I, we will leave this um, channel open. I've got another Zoom meeting. Yes, I figured you probably did, which is why I wanted to. Thanks say so thank much. You and really thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank you so, so much. much. Yes.